Thank you very much. It's lovely to be in Paris. Um, lovely to be in Paris when the weather is so good, precisely on the day of my lecture, with storms forecast for tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about some groups that have been of concern for me ever since, more or less, ever since I started um, doing mathematics, and long before the definition um, was actually coined. Um, and to introduce the talk, um, there are two natural examples I could choose. Um, one is the Gupta Sivki group, the other is the Grigorchuk group, first Grigorchuk group. Um, we've heard already a couple of accounts of the, uh, of the Grigorchuk group, so I start with the um, Gupta Sivki group. The Gupta Sivki group is a group of automorphisms of the, of the ternary tree. Um, drawn here, t equals t3, 3 for ternary. So, um, oh, I've, I've observed this happening to other people in the past and wondered why it was happening, and now I understand. <laughs> um, so, um, what you see then, um, this vertex here, for example, it has valency 4, and we have three edges coming down and one going up. So valency 4, even though it's the ternary tree. And um, what I'm describing is two automorphisms here. Um, A is the automorphism that takes the three trees um, with roots, these vertices here, and uh, permutes them in the one and only sensible fashion. Um, the second automorphism, called B, um, is just No, it's quite entertaining, actually. <laughs> and at, this <laughs> at this stage in the afternoon, um, uh, and with this temperature, I have to keep you awake as well. So, um, so A is permuting these three trees in the obvious fashion, um, and B is uh, recursively defined as A, A to the minus 1, B, a triple. Um, that is to say, it acts on T1, the tree here, exactly how A acted on the big tree, so in particular, um, since A took that vertex to that, B takes that vertex to that, etc. Um, and um, so you get the idea. A to the minus 1 on the second tree, and B on the third tree. So this is a, a recursive definition. And the uh, gupta sivki 3 group is the group generated by uh, these two elements, A and B. Um, the group has remarkable properties. Um, the first properties were discovered by Gupta and Sivki, um, who proved that it was a three group. It's very clearly residually finite because any non trivial element acts non trivially on one of those layers of the tree. Um, and it's recursively presented and has soluble word problem. And then Sivki, in a later paper, proved that it's a just infinite branch group. And I'm going to say what just infinite branch groups are um, in probably the next but one slide. Um, more recent interesting results are in the other direction. Um, uh, Alejandra Garrido uh, proved that this group is subgroup separable. That is to say, um, every finitely generated subgroup is the intersection of the finite index subgroups containing it and has soluble generalized word problem. Moreover, every finitely generated subgroup is as close as it could be to being isomorphic either to the trivial group or to G itself or to G cross G. Uh, up to finite index, um, each subgroup is finitely generated subgroup is, well, infinite finitely generated subgroup is abstractly commensurable with G or G cross G. And the definition of abstractly commensurable is there. Um, I should say that um, Alejandro has proved other important results that I ought to be mentioning today. Um, some of them are to be found on her poster, which is still uh, available. Thank you. 
So a just infinite group then is um, a group that's infinite and has the properties of the, that all of its non-trivial normal subgroups have finite index. Uh, G is hereditarily just infinite um, if every subgroup of finite index is just infinite. Um, hereditarily will come again. Um, it all, always means that all subgroups of finite index have the property. Um, we need to um, look at more general trees, and here is the rooted tree of type 2, 3, 2, 3, and so on. Actually, what I haven't told you is that the next digit in that sequence is 17. Um, it, it's not necessarily, not necessarily um, a periodic sequence. Um, oh, and the next one is 18, after, after 17. Um, so there's a root vertex uh, drawn right at the top in my trees. Um, um, you'll see that the group comes in layers. The second layer, the, um, the um, vertices in the second layer are red blotches, uh, six of them, because six is two times three. And again, we have this... Um, uh, this pro uh, property concerning the valency of vertices. Uh, this vertex has valency three. Two edges go down, one go, uh, goes up. Each vertex U is um, the root itself of uh, a tree called, uh, which I tend to denote as TU. Um, yes, and so we're going to consider automorphisms of trees like that. Uh, T is to act faithfully uh, fixing V. Um, so, of course, the second layer then is a union of G orbits because distances are preserved by these automorphisms. Uh, the restricted stabilizer of vertex U, it consists of all automorphisms, um, only automorphisms doing things to that tree but fixing all of the vertices. So, for example, a conjugate of this group here will um, be the restricted stabilizer of some other uh, vertice, vertex in the second layer. And um, you'll see that these two subgroups together, this restricted stabilizer and that one, they generate the direct product. Very important property. Um, finally, the, uh, the restricted stabilizer of the second layer consists of, it is the direct product of all of the subgroups that I just talked about, all of the um, direct products of all restricted stabilizers of things in the second layer. So now, um, more generally, and um, not more illuminatingly, but um, you know, we, we need to have uh, a proper um, definition. So we're now fixing an arbitrary sequence of integers mn greater than or equal to 2. The rooted tree of the type, this sequence, it has a root vertex of valency m0. And the vertices of distance n greater than or equal to 1 from v0 have valency mn plus 1 for the reason that I've already explained. The nth layer, again, consists of all vertices at distance n from um, the root vertex, and um, I've said that I shall call uh, the subtree with root u, tu. So g now acts faithfully on this tree, and the restricted stabilizers are exactly as I said in the previous slide, um, restricted vertex stabilizers and restricted level stabilizers. And this is the definition of a branch group. G acts as a branch group on T if for each n we have transitive action on the nth layer and the restricted stabilizer, the nth restricted stabilizer, has finite index in G. Very short, simple definition. Um, so some examples and motivation. Um, here are some groups that are um, um, branch groups. Alyoshin's group um, on the binary tree, um, Grigorchuk's first group, uh, the gupta sivki p group, there is a generalization for all p, uh, all odd primes p. Um, and these are all um, torsion groups, um, finitely generated and infinite. 
So the first, um, no, no, not the first examples, but certainly the easiest examples to understand um, uh, that are counterexamples to the general Burnside conjecture. Next, but not really necessarily chronologically next, um, for any integer m greater than or equal to 5, there are branch groups g on the emery tree with the following properties. The g is isomorphic to g wreath, the alternating group of degree m. What's, the, what's this um, wreath product here? Um, so I've got um, this group g. Um, I take m copies of it, the direct product of them, and I just permute them, let the alternating group permute them in the obvious way. That is the wreath product. Um, and that group is supposed to be isomorphic to G itself. Um, and so that property holds, uh, but also every non-trivial normal subgroup is actually the kernel of the action on one of the layers of the tree. Um, um, yeah. So being the kernel of an action on a finite set, is, it has finite index. So any group like this is just infinite. The first examples were discussed by Philip Hall and Rex Dark in the 1960s, and they were locally finite. Is this the, is this the permutation with Yes, yes. M things are being permuted by the alternating group of degree M. Um, so, and finitely generated examples, um, it was a struggle to find them. When I first looked at things like this in the... Um, 1970s, I guess, no, late 1960s, um, it was a big open question for me whether there were actually finitely generated examples. And it took um, really quite a lot of hard work for Peter Neumann to construct the first example of a finitely generated group. He needed it to prove properties concerning largeness of group, largeness of groups in the sense of P, uh, Steve Pride. Um, the constructions have been much streamlined since then, and um, by the time Dan Siegel um, used such groups to deal with subgroup growth, and I dealt with such groups to say things about non-uniform exponential growth, um, the descriptions of the groups themselves were uh, much simpler. There was still quite a lot of work to do for both Siegel and for me. Then I'm going to gloss over an, a, a whole lot of other really interesting groups that have been studied by many people. All of the groups that I've mentioned so far, at least in those that I glossed over, uh, except in those that I glossed over, are just infinite. And in 1972, essentially in my PhD thesis, the second half of my PhD thesis, was the proof that if G is just infinite and not virtually abelian, that is, if it doesn't have an abelian subgroup of finite index, then either G embeds as a subgroup of finite index in one of those reef products of the sort that I just described, um, with the bottom group hereditarily just infinite, or else G is a branch group. Um, so, <coughs> I think that um, branch, um, branch groups are, are a jolly important thing to study. Um, uh, the class of branch groups has interesting groups that have solved a variety of problems negatively, but also branch groups arise as one case in a classification theorem. Um, what gets um, the subject off the ground is actually a a beautiful lemma of Slava Grigorchuk. Um, if G is a branch group on a tree T, and K is a non-trivial normal subgroup, then K would like to contain one of these restricted stabilizers. Actually, it, it won't necessarily do that, but it'll contain the derived group. The prime here means derived group of. So in particular, then, the quotient of um, G modulo this K it's actually virtually abelian. And the proof um, 
In a longer lecture, I'd probably work through the proof, but this shows you just how long it is. It, it, it's short and beautiful. Um, Slava and I, in joint work, proved another property of branch groups, namely that they have no non-trivial virtually abelian normal subgroups. I'm going to call a group Boolean if it's non-trivial and has those two properties. Every proper quotient is virtually abelian. You might call such a group just non-virtually abelian, but um, um, that's starting to get a little bit long. Um, so that property, and also G has no non-trivial virtually abelian normal subgroups. So branch groups then are Boolean, and um, here is a picture of George Boole, um, my countryman, an Englishman, um, not only English, he was born 13 miles, about 50 kilometers away from where I was born, but somewhat earlier. Who was he drinking with? What makes you think he was drinking? He, he's looking, he looks rather serious to me. He, he doesn't... <laughs> That, that is a good point, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I now want to study some, uh, extract some properties um, and say something um, actually fairly quickly because uh, time flies. Um, so, I want to assume the property that I'm going to call branch one, that G is a Boolean group. And I want to look inside this group at the set of subgroups having only finitely many conjugates. It's a lattice of subgroups. That means it's, uh, if I take an intersection or join of two such subgroups, then it again has the same property. It's in the class. And um, it has some rather striking properties. Um, for example, if I take two of the subgroups, then they have trivial intersection if and only if they commute with each other. And under those circumstances, of course, they generate their direct product. Second, if H is one of the uh, groups in this family, then there is... Oh. It works when you don't want it to. Uh, um, if H is in the class, then H, uh, of course, commutes with its centralizer, so they generate the direct product. And uh, that direct product contains some subgroup U of finite index, or rather, the derived group of some subgroup of finite index. So, let's take this family again, uh, L of G, and I'm going to say that H1 and H2 are equivalent if they have the same centralizer. So it's obviously an, an equivalence relation, and I can consider the quotient set. Um, well, it happens that the lattice operations in LG the lattice operations of taking intersection and group generated by induce well-defined uh, meet and join operations in the quotient set. And that quotient set is called the structure lattice of the group. So it has a biggest element, the class containing the whole group, and the class containing the, uh, the trivial group, um, well, um, the class containing the trivial group is act just contains the trivial group because of that um, condition in the second line there, and the fact that there aren't any abelian normal subgroups, in particular the center is trivial. Um, it also holds that each um, equivalence class has a unique complement in the lattice sense, namely uh, the class containing the centralizer of, rep of a representative. Um, you can see immediately that the intersection of those two is trivial. It's uh, not quite so easy to see that uh, the meet, uh, the, the join of those two things is, is the largest element of the lattice. Finally, uh, L is also modular, uh, and that follows really because of properties of normal subgroups. Um, the normal subgroup lattice of any group is modular, and this is a, uh, a direct consequence of that. And it happens, it, it's a, a result in, an easy result in lattice theory that uh, a lattice which is uniquely complemented and modular is a Boolean lattice. 
So that's why I chose the name <laughs> Boolean. Um, so some examples. Um, let's say that G is hereditary Boolean if um, all subgroups of finite index are Boolean. And that holds if and only if the lattice contains two elements. In now, uh, next consider a, permuta a permutational wreath product, um, S wreath the symmetric group with H, sorry, with S hereditarily Boolean. Then W is Boolean and it has order 2 to the M. We know what finite Boolean lattices are. They're um, the sets of subsets of a finite set. Um, a, a lattice of, they are the only Boolean lattices. And in this case, um, the Boolean lattice consists of all representatives of direct products of um, um, the obvious direct factors of the base group of this wreath product. There is also a converse result to that. And then finally, um, if L is infinite, then L is isomorphic to the lattice of closed and open subgroups of Cantor's ternary set. And when I realized this in my PhD thesis, I thought it was really cool. Um, um, we now know a little bit more. And um, in the case where G is also a branch group, a stronger condition, um, Alejandro and I observed that uh, L is isomorphic to the projective limit, the inverse limit of um, the power sets of the layers. Um, not only that, this is a G equivariant isomorphism. Um, I need another definition, and um, gosh, I need to keep a real eye on the time here. Um, let G be Boolean. Um, a subgroup B is called a basal subgroup if it has only finitely many conjugates. Um, no, not that. Oh, well, we'll leave that. <laughs> um, if it has only finitely many conjugates, and these distinct conjugates generate their direct product. So, for example, restricted stabilizers of vertices in branch groups. I already pointed that out when we were looking at uh, one of those graphs. But also, the natural direct factors of the base group of this reef product, they are basal subgroups as well. Um, and I want to define gamma of G to be um, the subset of the structure lattice containing all of the classes containing basal subgroups. It's um, fairly clearly a countable po um, partially ordered set with a maximal condition. And you make it into a graph. Um, so the vertices are there, but the edges are the pairs A comma B with B maximal in the set of all things less than, um, less than A. So that is called the structure graph. And um, very, very briefly, um, of course, the automorphism group of G acts on the subgroup lattice. That induces an action on um, my L of G. It also induces an action on gamma of G. And this action is faithful if and only if branch 2 holds. I've just, just written down the definition. You don't need to think about it. Um, here's a third condition that you can think about if you like, but I don't really want you to. Um, it, it is a third condition that uh, you see just says something about basal subgroups um, in the group, and having f uh, something is supposed to have finite index. Um, um, so, I want to assume branch 1, branch 2, and branch 3. Then it follows that gamma G has subtrees on which G acts as a branch group, which is sort of, um, it, it's nice, because it means that G, from its own internal structure, knows that it's a branch group. It doesn't need to have that tree. Um, uh, this, this already uh, shows these properties of the group itself show that it's a branch group. And conversely, of course, branch groups do satisfy the three conditions. OK, it's hot. We need a change. Um, so <laughs> um, let's have a little interlude. Um, 
Um, I, I chose to talk a bit about first order properties and I'm so embarrassed that there's some real experts in the audience here. Um, but there are some people who aren't experts and um, so uh, I'm going to imagine that I'm talking to them. So here's a way of saying that a group is nilpotent of class less than or equal to two. Some, uh, some quantifiers and then um, a statement, a mathematical statement. These quantifiers, it's understood that they're ranging over the whole of G. Um, so that's good. But here's another description of the class of, um, of nilpotent groups of class at most two. For all X in G prime and for all Z, um, something holds. Quantification here is over not G, but over something else. And uh, that's not allowed. Um, there are circumstances when quantification, for example, if every element of G prime were a product of 37 commutators, I could replace that quantification by a quantification over two times whatever the number I just said was. What's 74, I guess. 74 things. Um, um, of course, you'll recognize that the example isn't a brilliant example in that um, the, the reason of juxt juxtaposing the, I, I mean, um, yeah, uh, let me not say any more. Um, that, that, uh, that doesn't work. That's not a first order statement. Here is a, a first order statement. Um, given any four elements, um, the product of the two commutators is a product of one commutator. So in fact, it says that every element of the uh, derived group is a commutator. Um, you can say that sort of thing using first order sentences, quantifying over the whole group. And um, um, here's another statement saying that G has at least three elements. What it actually says is that given two elements, you can find another element different from them both. That's, that's um, perfectly legitimate. And similarly, uh, you can say that a group has at, um, at most three elements. Uh, you can also say that a group doesn't have any elements of order two and three. That sentence does that. Implied is allowed. Not necessary, but allowed. Um, and you can also say that G has order four. It has order G to the fourth is one and G squared is not equal to one. Ah, this isn't allowed. Um, look, here I've quantified over something which isn't the whole group and doesn't even pretend to be related to the group. It's the set of integers. You can't say that an element has finite order in first order mathematics. Uh, you also can't say that a group is finite. Um, you, here's another bad example, and this is a better illustration than the one up there. You can't say that all elements of the derived group have order seven. You could have order, uh, say that all elements of the derived group have order um, uh, dividing seven if every element were a bounded product of commutators. Okay, all very simple. So um, some classes of groups can be axiomatized. Um, uh, I've just shown you, essentially, uh, that there's a sentence that says that a group has order at most n, or at order, at order at least n. Uh, you can also say that there are no elements of order n. Um, given any finite group, there are first order sentences phi and psi such that um, G satisfies phi if and only if there's a subgroup isomorphic to ace, H, and uh, G satisfies psi if and only if G is isomorphic itself to H. And the proof is simply um, interpret the information from the multiplication table. Um, um, soluble groups. Um, Soluble groups don't look very first order somehow because um, um, you um, need to make lots of statements. Um, however, they are defined by this property. If you think about it for a moment, you'll see it. No non-trivial element is a product of commutators with the two entries conjugate to the original element. That is because this group, of course, is in the derived group of the normal subgroup generated by G which is going to be smaller um, if the group is soluble. And you can say that um, what I've 
put here in brackets uh, in a first order way. Um, rho n has to hold for all n, where n is this sentence here. Um, however, for finite groups you can, and this is a slight digression, for finite groups you can do slightly better than that. Um, a finite group is soluble if and only if it satisfies just rho 56. You don't need to look at all infinitely many sentences. Uh, so among the finite groups, you can tell just with one axiom whether a, a group is um, soluble or not. Um, also, there's a first order formula defining the largest soluble normal subgroup of each finite group. Um, what, does, what does that mean? Um, it means that there's this formula and a group element satisfies the formula if and only if it generates um, a soluble normal subgroup. Um, so definable sets then, they're the sets of elements generated, uh, defined by first order formulae, possibly with parameters from the group. So here are some examples. The center is definable, it's a set of all um, uh, x's satisfying this formula here. Similarly, the center lies of an element um, is definable. The set of all elements satisfying that e uh, equation there. Um, here are some more examples of definable sets. Um, I can look at all conjugates, uh, all elements of the form H commutator H to the G with um, uh, G, an element of G. That's definable. It depends on H, of course. I don't want to consider quite that. I want to put in a, a minus one there. And then if I've got two definable sets, then their product is also definable. So not only is UH the set of all such commutators definable, but so is the set of all products of three such. And um, um, you can imagine that with a, you can write down a sufficiently complicated first order sentence that says that, that defines the following set. The, set of, the union of all VH to the G is conjugates of H um, with the property that the intersection of these, that these two things don't commute with each other. Um, centralizers of definable sets are definable, um, clearly. Um, look, if um, S is defined by that formula, then the centralizer is the set of all T such that for all G, um, if G satisfies that, that is, is, is to say if, um, if G is in S, then G commutes with T. So in particular then, there's a first order formula, WH, with the property, omega of H, I guess, um, with the property that omega, omega G of H holds if and only if G is in the double centralizer of WH. And similarly, you can uh, see that there's going to be a beta X um, um, such that beta of x holds if and only if this double centralizer commutes with all of its distinct conjugates. Finally, um, there's a delta um, such that uh, delta h1, h2 holds if and only if these two double centralizers are equal. Um, I need to remind you or tell you about interpretations very briefly. Um, I like groups. In fact, I like them better than most algebraic structures. Um, but sometimes you can translate questions about other things, maybe artificially, into questions about groups. So um, this is the affine group over field K. Um, upper triangular matrices, but in order to get it to fit on one slide, I'm going to write X comma T for this matrix here. Um, and A is to be the set of all X comma ones, so it's actually matrices, upper unit triangular matrices. And that group, of course, is trying to be, it, it's, um, it really um, is the additive group of the field. Um, it's more or less an accident that we multiply these uh, two elements, but when we multiply two such elements, what we get up there is the sum. So A is pretty much like 
the additive group of the field. And this set here um, is um, the, the multiplicative group of the field. So you can see that A is a normal subgroup, um, G is the split extension of it by H. And now I want to fix E, um, the ordered pair 1, 1, um, which is um, an element of A. And yeah, E sometimes means identity element of a group. Um, it's not the identity of this group, uh, but it is the identity of something, as you'll probably see in a moment. So A, then, is a set of all elements K that commute with all of their conjugates, so it's definable. And H is a set of all things that commute with E, as it happens. Uh, just, just calculate it, and you'll see I've got it right. Um, so it is definable, but with parameter E. And now for elements A and B and A, I want to define their sum to be the group product. Um, but also I want to define their product to be 1 if A or B is equal to 1, and A to the G if not, where B is E to the G with G and G. And lo and behold, um, with these two operations, plus and star, uh, A becomes a field isomorphic to, S, uh, to K. We've interpreted the field in the group. Um, the set A is definable in G, I already said that, but also the operations on A are definable. What does that mean? Um, what I neglected to say was that, of course, you can have definable subsets, not just of G, but also of G cross G, ordered pairs or ordered triples. And so um, uh, the operation, I guess, is, is a set of ordered triples. So that is an interpretation of the field in the group. Um, OK, interlude over. Um, now back to the, the hard stuff, if you can take it. But I'm going to remind you um, what we were talking about. Um, I just got to the structure graph, and so I better remind you. Um, um, why is the structure graph interesting? Well, um, a branch group can act on essentially different maximal trees. Um, most of the branch groups one knows about, they come with a unique tree. Um, but sometimes not. And the various actions are en encoded in this structure graph. And there again, in case you forgot, is the definition of the, um, of the structure. Um, um, gosh, what time did I start? Um, what time do I finish, more to the point? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Uh, that's OK. That's doable. Um, um, yeah, so this is the definition of the, um, of the structure, um, structure graph. And conjugation, as I said, induces an action on this structure graph. Um, I want to give a different description, a new description. Um, so for a subset of G, I want to write C squared of G. In fact, I already did on a couple of slides back, for the centralizer of the centralizer. So each subset is contained in its second centralizer. And in fact, the third centralizer is equal to the first centralizer. That's, that's a trivial and well-known exercise. I'm going to call um, an element of L, one of these subgroups with finitely many conjugates, I'm going to call it closed if it's equal to its second centralizer. So it's contained in its second centralizer. I want the ones that are equal to their second centralizer. Um, well, if G happens to be a branch group, and H1 and H2 are groups, uh, are subgroups with finitely many conjugates, and they have the same, same centralizer, then one has this statement here. The second centralizers are the same. And that, of course, is totally trivial. I mean, um, the second centralizer is the center is the centralizer of this thing here. Um, not quite so trivial, but again, pretty easy, um, is the fact that if B is a basal subgroup, then its second centralizer is also basal. And it turns out to be useful also to know that if you've got two basal subgroups, both closed, and uh, one contained in the other, then the normalizers get bigger. 
Um, so now I want to define a new graph, and its vertices are the non-trivial closed basal subgroups. I'm going to write an edge between two vertices if one is a maximal proper closed basal subgroup of the other. So again, you've got um, a graph on which uh, G acts by conjugation. Um, yeah, I should probably have pointed out. Um, look, um, these two statements, A and B, mean that every element of the structure graph as previously defined has precisely one closed basal subgroup in it. So uh, there's there, if you like, the, the possibility of defining a map from the structure graph to the set of closed basal subgroups. Um, and not only that, um, restricted stabilizers are uh, closed basal subgroups. Um, and there is the proof. It's four lines. It's, it's easy. And um, when you put all of these things together, what you get is the following fact, that um, if G is a branch group acting on a tree T, then the map taking each B to its class is a G-equivariant isomorphism from this new structure, this, the set of closed basal subgroups, to the structure um, graph. Um, um, but also that V goes to its restricted stabilizer is a G-equivariant order-preserving injective map from T, the, uh, the tree on which G acts, to this object. So there's a very nice, um, simple description. Um, here are some properties of the... Um, actually, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to miss the properties. Um, um, so... Um, Lots of nice properties, um, but let's, let's think about um, a couple of little difficulties, some things uh, that, that really, well, they don't keep me asleep at night, but um, 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 things that ought to be clearer. It's not clear whether this graph has finite, va finite valency. I don't know that. And I also don't know whether there can be exactly Aleph null maximal trees. OK, so G is then a branch group. I want you to remember these definitions from the interlude. VH is this set here. V, no, VH is the product of all um, of three uh, commutators of this type. And WH was defined like that. And beta of X is the first order sentence saying that C squared of G, uh, WH, commutes with its distinct conjugates. Um, there's this key proposition um, that every closed basal subgroup is actually um, C squared G uh, WH for some H. That you have to prove. It's, um, um, it's a bit intricate. Um, and it uses, among other things, uh, the result of um, Philip Hardy, uh, then strengthened by Miklos, that branch groups don't satisfy any group laws. In particular, if you've got um, some U in, um, in the tree, then its restricted stabilizer contains two elements, X and Y, such that X squ Y squared is not equal to Y squared X squared. Um, well, I'm just, just stating the result that's used. It, uh, I'm not telling you why that's relevant. And so um, putting it all together, what you get is this. Um, there are first order formulae, tor, beta, and delta, such that the following holds for each branch group. G has a branch action on a unique maximal tree up to G equivariant isomorphism, if and only if G satisfies tor. Second, um, the set of elements satisfying beta of X, beta was on the previous slide, is a union of conjugacy classes, so G acts on it by conjugation. The relation defined by delta of XY is a G invariant preorder 
And so if you factor out by it, um, or rather make it symmetric and uh, factor out by it, then you get a partially ordered set on which G acts. And then this quotient set is G equivariantly isomorphic as a poset set to the structure of graph. Yes, so, um, and observe that um, this Q, again, it's definable. It's, um, it's a, a definable set, modulo a definable equivalence relation. The equivalence relation, of course, is a definable subset of G cross G. And um, so, in the case when G acts on a unique maximal tree, not only, as I said earlier, does it know that it's a branch group, but it also knows, in the sense of first order group theory, what the tree is. Um, not only what the tree is, but what the action on the tree is. Um, yes, so it's a param parameter free interpretation for T and also for the action on T. And just a um, final comment similar ideas with sets like this. Um, seem likely to work in other contexts. At the moment I'm looking at lattice-ordered groups. And also, this does give some... Um, you remember the characterization of um, solubility for finite groups. This gives a sort of very weak uh, axiomatization of the class of branch groups. Uh, but don't ask me to make that precise just at the moment. Thank you very much. I can't remember what the question of pride was. Because uh, in 84, in my paper on the intermediate growth, I showed the first group and all other G owner groups uh, solved uh, still pride yes, problem uh, on Lachin. Um, um, pride had several questions. Um, it all uh, solves all questions. Well, <laughs> At that stage, maybe information between countries was not flowing quite as well as it does now. All the questions are asked. No, no. So, so the branch, so the trees in which G acts the branch group are in the subtrees of this structure, right? Yes. How does G, do you get an action of G on these different trees? Um, well, um, if you're given the structure graph, then um, you can find trees essentially by looking at anything which is co-final in the graph. Um, I mean, it goes down, uh, there's an element of the subtree below any given element of the graph. But there, are, there may be various ways of doing this, and so this is why you get different trees arising. <laughs>